Welcome to the Navigating Hollywood podcast. My name is Alan Wolf, and I'm a filmmaker, author, and game creator. Navigating Hollywood encourages and equips entertainment professionals to live relationally and spiritually holistic lives. If you work in entertainment, visit navigatinghollywood.org to discover how you can get involved. Today, we're joined by television writer and producer Monica Maser. Monica has written for some of the most acclaimed television series over the last 15 years. She's currently a consulting producer for HBO's Station Eleven. She was the executive producer for MacGyver, Queen Sugar, Nashville, and Hentified, which was nominated for a Peabody Award. She was a writer on Lost, Teen Wolf, Prison Break, and more. She was also named as one of Variety's 10 Writers to Watch. Amazing! Welcome, Monica! Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Oh, great to have you. Would you agree that your first big break was on the show Lost? Definitely. That was my first staff gig. And mm. prior to that, I had been a writer's assistant for two seasons on mm. 24. And I remember getting the meeting and being so excited. They had already started the room and they had just enough money left to hire a staff writer. So I uh, felt like I hit the lotto when I got that. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> like, did you do something to celebrate? Like when you got that news, that is huge. It is huge. You know, I was still an assistant at 24, so I got the news when I was at my desk at 24, mm. and my agent was like, you start tomorrow. And it was like 5 o'clock on a oh. Wednesday. So I had to run around to all my bosses at 24 and tell them, and they were so excited because they had put calls in for me. And and I asked them their advice, like, "What do you have any advice for me? And they were all like, you know, don't be a talkie staff writer, listen more. You know, they all pretty much said the same. Remember you're a staff writer. It's a very hierarchical system. You know, I do, do all the homework. And it was so exciting. It was, we were on a J.J. Abrams show. We were right across the sidewalk from Alias. So we got to know those writers really well. And we had lunches together. And it was just a really cool time. And when you left the show, did you know what would happen to the storyline? You know what? Not really. So we, we had started preliminary conversations about season two. And mm. so we, we knew certain things that were going to happen. We also, at one point, JJ had come into the room in the middle of season one and said, we have to figure out what the island is. So we spent the <laughs> whole day with him while he, was, he had taken a break from prepping Mission Impossible and tried to figure out what the island was. We came up with an idea and, and Damon Lindelof, the co-creator was like, I don't think it's going to end up being that, but at least we have something, um, right, right, right. you know, so that it's in our brain. We know what we're working mm. towards. And mm. yeah, I didn't, I didn't really know what was going to happen. You know, after I left the show, I was just really thankful for the opportunity thankful to be able to contribute in what I felt was really meaningful way because Sun and Jin were Korean characters on, you know, network TV for the first time, speaking in Korean, subtitled, I'm half Korean. So that was a huge win and just like kind of a moment in television, I think. And I was really excited. You know, Damon said to me when I when I left, your DNA is imprinted on those characters because so much was pulled from asking my mother questions, but also pulling from things that I knew about Korean culture and about my family's history. That's amazing. And how special is that? Mm -hmm. Very special. And did your ideas on what you thought the island was, did they end up going with that or did it end up changing eventually? I think it ended up changing. It ended up changing ah. because also Damon was very much in touch with what the fans were thinking, what they were wanting, were communicating with the fans. And he really didn't want any idea that a fan or and that was sort of like out there in the zeitgeist. He was like, it has to be something different, which was really hard. So, but I think, you know, in the end, it ended up, it ended well. How did you get your start as a writer? I think even in like middle school, I was told by teachers, like, you're a really good writer. When you're, you know, in sixth grade, you don't really know, okay, how does that translate to a job in the future? And then in high school, I thought, oh, that means I'm going to be a journalist, which 
I wasn't going to be a journalist, um, but <laughs> it was the, the most tangible thing that I could think of. And then when I got to hmm. college, I wrote a very short play, a one act play called Vassar in a Nutshell. I went to Vassar College and my professor, my English professor said, this is the best thing you've written all year. And I was like, oh, interesting. Then it was produced sophomore year in the fall by the college because they wanted to promote dialogue. There were a lot of things going on on campus about stereotypes and racial and cultural misunderstandings. So they Mm. used it as a springboard for discussion. And I directed it. And just seeing people respond to my writing and laughing at the jokes, you know, it was like an auditorium full of students. And then an upperclassman who I really respected, his name was Danny, came up to me and said, that was really good. And I was like, thanks. He was like, you should do this for a living. I was like, you mean like playwright? And he was like, yeah, you should do this. And from that moment forward, I was like, I'm doing this for a living. So people really spoke a lot of encouragement into your life. Yes, they spoke a lot of encouragement. Hmm. My parents were very proactive in sort of giving me opportunities that were, you know, in theater where I was going to make $75 a week, you know, after graduating (laughs) and having student loan debt. They were like, it's fine. That was a lot of money in 1939. I don't know. That's what you hear in like old movies where they're like, well, we're paying us $75 a week. And you're like, oh, that's a lot of money. I, I was like, what? <laughs> so I did. I got a lot of encouragement and a lot of support from my parents. My mom, one summer, I, I wanted to work at the Old Globe Theater assisting the director. Again, that paid like peanuts. And so she rented an apartment, stayed with me, would cook all my meals, send me <laughs> off to rehearsal. So my parents really encouraged and supported me. Wow, that's incredible. And are they just amazed and so proud of you today? Yeah, my my father has since passed, but before he passed, he I was visiting him and he walked into a Walmart and he said, I bet I'm the only person in this Walmart that can walk to the DVD section and pull out something and say, my daughter wrote on this show. So he's so proud and my mom is really proud too. I talked about you being the executive producer of multiple series, but I know in the world of movies, the title of executive producer doesn't have a a ton of significance, at least as much as it does in television. Can you describe the difference? Executive producer in television. So for me, the shows that you mentioned, specifically Queen Sugar, MacGyver, and Hentified, I was the executive producer and showrunner. With the title of showrunner, you are the head writer you are the main person to interface with the studio and network and production company. And there are other executive producers on the show from the production company, but they are more creative producers that give you notes on your script, give you notes on the cut of an episode. As the executive producer slash showrunner, you're doing everything from breaking story in the room to writing your own episodes to rewriting outlines and other episodes to being on set and producing the episode, but you're responsible for the entire show. That's Mm -hmm. why you're called the showrunner. Mm -hmm. Now in film, and I just learned this recently, I think I knew it and forgot it and then was reminded about that big title in film to get on the producer side is producer, not executive producer. So the producer on the film side is the one that is doing all the things similar, I would say, to the showrunner, but split with the director and helping the director fulfill their vision. Executive producer, what I've sort of been told and learned over the years is that's more of like, I don't want to say vanity title, but it's more of, you know, it might be the production company executives or it might, but they are not the ones boots on the ground doing the day-to-day work. They might represent the company or a big, be a big you know, EP from the studio, or maybe they option the original material for the entire project. But I kind of feel like EP slash showrunner in television, you're the general. And I do answer up, you know, I do have to answer up to the president and, and all of that, but you're the general. And I feel the same way when you're the boots on the ground producer for film, you're a general and you are moving troops and moving equipment and trying to make your days. 
yeah, you're at war. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Entertainment exactly. war, and it's got to keep moving forward. <laughs> yes. Well, after the tremendous success of Lost and then Prison Break, what did your dance card look like? So after Prison Break, I had my daughter, and it coincided, oddly enough, with the writer's strike. At first, I was like, I feel like a lot of working moms feel this way in TV. Um, You feel like you're never going to work again because you're just like at home, like rocking the baby. And you're just, your whole world has been like exploded and you have to rebuild it around your child. And and then the writer's strike happened. And I remember I would, I would do the shift where we loaded the signs into the vehicles, into the vehicles at night because it counted as two shifts. Cause I was like, I need to get double shifts here because I have a baby at home. Um, <laughs> right after that, you know, a friend reached out to me, he was Korean American and he said, Hey, you know, there's this production company in Korea that is looking for a Korean American writer who has sort of edgy action credits like yours to consult on a show. So he said, oh, okay, we'll send them my way. Think, not thinking anything of it. Cut to, you know, four months later, I'm on a flight with my mom and my like nine month old child flying to Korea to consult on a Korean oh. drama. And I did that wow. for five weeks. And then the strike wow. ended and my agent was like, come back to LA. And it was amazing. We worked maybe about four hours a day because we had a translator. My Korean is very like baby Korean and his English wasn't as proficient. So we needed a translator. So I would pitch ideas in English. The translator would translate it. He would listen and respond. And that's how we worked. And it was so challenging, but so rewarding. And after we finished our four hours of work, we would always go eat. (laughs) Because we were so tired and hungry and drained. You know, right after that, I was also really fortunate to get the first show right after the strike to staff, I got on Knight Rider, the reboot of Knight Rider that NBC was doing. I was like, oh, I'm never going to work again. What's my life going to be? And then I got a job in Korea and then I came home and I got the job right out of the box of the first show that was up and running in April. Mm. That was a total blessing. And I felt like it was like, I was like, girl, I got you. Stop. Stop. (laughs) Why are you stressing? I always have you. (laughs) And was your husband stressed at all during this time? You know, my husband's very even keel and he's kind Mm. of a go with the flow kind of mentality. And I'm a planner. So I think Mm. I was stressed and like, what's going to happen? And he was like, it's all right. Like everything will work out. And from Knight Rider, did you then move on to Nashville? I did Knight Rider and then I did Teen Wolf on MTV ah, okay. the first season of okay. Wolf. That was great, but it was also the timing of it was odd because we weren't going to know if we were going to get a season two until after network staffing. And I was like, oh, what's going to happen? And your husband's like, don't worry about it. Yeah. It's not going to work out. <laughs> well, he's an actor and he's like, his entire career has been freelance. And I think mm. as writers, we're like, I just want to get on a show that's going to go five seasons and never have to worry about staffing. And of course, <laughs> it never works out that way. <laughs> so he was used to the up and down and huh. sort of the tumultuous nature of the industry mm-hmm. where I was like, I just want to get on a show that's going to go five, five seasons. And of course right. I, ne- I never <laughs> did. From there, my friend was like, Hey, I'm going to go be the number two on the playboy club on NBC. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, yes, because I don't even know if we have a season two of teen wolf. So I called my boss and he was like, uh, of course, of course, because mm-hmm. I don't want you to be without a job. So I was able to go with her to that show. And that show only lasted six episodes, three that aired. Only three of them aired. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. And when people hear it, it sounds salacious, but it wasn't salacious, was it? It wasn't. No, it wasn't salacious. It was, it was about the jazz club in mm. Chicago that the bunnies worked at as cocktail waitresses. So it was essentially, I I think, you know, maybe the misstep there was calling it the Playboy Club because everyone thought the magazine. Right. When I read the script, it was clear. It was about the cocktail waitresses. It was about 20 something women trying to figure out their lives in early 1960s in Chicago. And that was one where I too was like, "Mm, what is the Playboy Club about? Mm Because I wasn't really sure. But then when I read the script, I was like, this is not about the magazine at all. Hmm. Hmm. 
I feel like Nashville, it seems like that was another big step forward for you. Is that true? It was. It was a big step forward for me. So, you know, the first half of my career, I feel like there were a lot of action credits. You know, I was uh, the girl who was trained by the writers of 24. And then I went to Lost, you know, which is this big show genre. And then I went to Prison Break, very action, you know, testosterone driven explosions and car chases. And then did Knight Rider, again, action, teen wolf genre. And the Playboy Club was the first turn for me. And I had said to my manager, look, I want to write, you know, soaps and character driven things. And she was like, look at your resume. Your resume does not reflect that you can do that. So she said, you have to write a sample that is character driven or soapy. And then you have to reach out to your friends that work on those shows and get Mm. them to read that so that you can possibly open up the door. And that was Karen. Karen read my sample that I wrote that it was still actiony, but it was was character driven, read that and that opened the door. And then I was like, yay, I got my shot on the Playboy Club. Even though I was really hired because there was a mob storyline, it was fine. (laughs) I still got to write women in their twenties trying to figure out their life. Mm. And then we got canceled and I went to deception on NBC which Mm. the leads were Megan Good and Laz Alonzo. And that was a Liz Heldon show. And that was, you know, even though it was a mystery thriller, there were, it was very soapy Mm. and very character driven. Mm. And so that helped me turn the corner. And that was only one season. It was a mid season show. And that really helped me get in the door with Nashville to show like Mm. I can do soap. I just worked on deception in the playboy club and Nashville you know, I went from being a producer to a co-EP on that show, produced all the episodes that I wrote, hmm. spent a good amount of time in the city of Nashville. And hmm. I really feel like, you know, that's sort of where I earned my stripes as hmm. a producer. We had a huge cast and three musical numbers in every episode. So totally, it hmm. was a lot to juggle and it really stretched me as a writer. And I feel like I grew a lot as a writer hmm. under the tutelage of that showrunner d johnson i think i Mm. became a stronger emotional and character writer Mm. wow and from there eventually i love that that all of this eventually led to macgyver i mean another (laughs) classic show (laughs) from there so from there then i i did a couple other shows but i got my showrunner stripes on on um queen sugar on own and then i went to run show run hentified season one where we got the Peabody Ward. And then after that, it was like the pandemic hit. We weren't sure if Hentified was going to get another season. It was a really weird time in March of 2020. My agent called me in April and said, Hey, you know, Peter Lenkoff and CBS want to meet with you for MacGyver. Are you interested? And I said, I am. And he was like, okay, okay, let's set up the meeting. And a lot of my friends were like, MacGyver? Like, you just ran Queen Sugar and Hentified. Those are, like, critically acclaimed and character-driven. Right, and I said, right. you have to remember, I am the young writer who was in the action room. I was usually the mm. only woman or the only person of color. Action is a really strong muscle for me. And I also, in watching the series, felt like I could put some spin on the ball with it. I was like, this is an action show. What it needs to do is go deeper into character and they need to play up this love triangle. It's an action show at the oldest of the old guard networks. And for me, a woman and who is black and Asian to be the showrunner of that and to get this job where it's not about me being black or Asian or a woman is a win. Mm. In Hmm. terms of representation and other writers of color scene, I can do that. I know Hmm. the woman who I didn't know her personally coming up the ladders. For me, it was Pam Vise. She was running CBS shows that had nothing to do with her race or gender. And she was the showrunner. And I would read about her Hmm. in the trades. And it was like, if she could do that, I can do that. And I wanted to, you know, especially being African-American Asian, show people, yeah, you can be a black Asian girl and run an action show on network TV. To me, it was a win. Mm. Why do you think the writers rooms are so male dominated? I don't think showrunners of those shows set out to say, I'm just going to hire all men. I think it is 
subconscious. I think it is Hmm. people hire their friends and people that they have worked with before. And I also think of it as like people need to educate themselves and read writers of color and women more and, and, mm. and familiarize, reach out to their agent. Tell them who are your top five female writers that write action. I want to read them and I want to get to know them, even though I'm not staffing now. And I think it just comes from, you know, who, you know, and so therefore that's who you staff. That's what I've sort of seen coming up, you know, being in these rooms. And then usually the studio or the network will say, hey, there's three female leads in this show, too. You need some women on staff. Hmm. And then Hmm. they'll start reading women. But usually it's like they came up, you know, during a time where there were very few women on staff and their rooms were male dominated. So they picked their three friends that they liked the best from the shows that they've worked on in the past. And so it Hmm. perpetuates this cycle that needs to be broken. And more people need to be given access. And slowly, things are changing. You mentioned that that woman, when you read about her in the trades, that she was inspiring to you. Has anyone said that to you? Yes. I did a Zoom with a young woman who is, we call it Hapa, when you're half Asian. And she's Hapa. She's half Asian and half Caucasian. And she said, I've never met another writer who's half Asian like me, and you're a showrunner. And I told her this story. I said, after running Queen Sugar, I took a job during that time because I was developing as the number two on a show. I was only there for two weeks because then my dad was put in hospice. And I was like, oh, I really need to go be with my father. But I, when I walked in that writer's room and there was another writer that I knew on the show, another Asian American writer, and she was like, Monica, and she was like, the number two. And my heart sank because I had climbed the ladder and worked so hard to get to show her to hear someone say, oh, you're the number two. I was like, oh my gosh. And I said to that young Hoppa writer, I said, I'll never do that again. I said, I am holding wow. a place for you. As a Hapa Mm. writer, as a half Asian, half black writer, I said, I'm holding Mm. this spot for you so that Mm -hmm. you know and that you can see that you can get here too. And that doesn't mean I won't take a number two job or a consulting producer job. It has to be the right job. That show, you know, everything that was going on with my dad, it wasn't the right show at the right time for me to be like, yay, Mm. I'm the number two. Now, after having run three shows, I could take a job like that and it wouldn't be as much of a thing for me. But when I told her that I'm holding a place for you and you can do this too, you can be a showrunner, even though I'm the only other half Asian showrunner you've ever met who's a woman, she started crying. And she was like, I needed to hear that. That's so encouraging. (laughs) Well, the storylines of MacGyver often involve him coming up with imaginative solutions to get out of situations. What was it like coming up with those solutions? It was so much fun. I have to give a shout out to the MacGyver season five writer's room. First of all, hello, doing television in a pandemic on Zoom, doing your writer's room where you have a new boss and, you know, another new writer coming on board that you've never met in person. And, you know, the writer's room in person is like over lunch, we eat together, you get to know each other. You know, when you go into the break room and you get your coffee, people make small talk. That's how you build rapport. So I inherited a staff that didn't know me that had to get to know their new boss over Zoom. Hmm. So hard, so hard. And Hmm. the blessing of it was that the majority of the staff was returning. So they had been on season for really smart, you know, MacGyver was a well-oiled machine and just came up with so many great ideas. So I have to give credit to the writer staff. They, you know, were very imaginative and creative. And the only thing that I changed was I was like, instead of breaking story from the point of breaking the mission first, I said, we're going to break from character POV first. I said, I know that's weird in an action room to do that, but having done both, uh, I'll, I'm telling you, it'll work. And the story will resonate emotionally because that's what we want. We're always going to have run and jump. We're a mission of the week show. Mac is always going to figure out how to make something work with his, his pen, his glasses, and his cell phone. And he's going to blow up, <laughs> open a door, and we're going right. to save the day. I said, the right. point of the story is to make people feel something. Mm. And if you go deeper into character, 
we can have both. We can have our cake and eat it too. So it was fun. It was fun doing research, you know, on if you have these three elements. And we also, I have to give credit, we also had a tech advisor who is like a physics professor who would give us information on how things to work. So not just the writing staff, also our tech advisor. Oh, I see. Okay. And speaking about just building interesting characters, I loved at the beginning of Station Eleven, the show on HBO, where one of the main characters at that point runs onto the stage because he thinks someone's having a heart attack. And then he's asked if he's a doctor and he's not a doctor. And you're just like, he says, no, I'm not a doctor. And you're just immediately interested. Who is this person? Why did he run on stage? And it just kind of goes from there. Can you tell us more about Station Eleven? Sure. So Patrick Somerville is the creator of that. And I met with him while I was developing and he was like, I need someone to come in a couple days a week and run the room. He had two shows going at the same time. One was in production and the room on station 11 was going. He's like, I can't be there every day. And I just really need you to sort of like run the room and talk story with the rest of the writers. So he had already written the pilot. So I read that and I was like blown away. I was like, Oh my gosh, I love this. I love his writing. I love this world. I had never read the book, but I was just immediately pulled in. And the room was really great. You know, it was a lot of fun breaking those stories and reading the book and seeing the difference between what Patrick was doing in the adaptation because he started his career as a novelist. So it was just a lot of fun working with the writers and seeing Patrick's process because the great thing about him not being there every day is he would have a fresh perspective when he heard what we worked on. And he's very imaginative and he wasn't afraid to say, that's all great, but what if we, you know, spin this around and do it from this 180 degree perspective, which I thought was also really refreshing and kept things like really fresh and inventive Mm -hmm. in the room. I really appreciate the show's use of art to inspire people who survive the devastation that happens. How do you connect to that theme? I think that art for me, it's so interesting, you know, especially, you know, being a kid who was like, oh, you're a writer and always gravitating more towards the arts. It's so interesting that in school, art and drama And it's seen as like extracurricular. It's not really given priority. You know, and you look at public school funding in the U.S., the arts program, the music program, the dance program, those theater, they always get cut first. And when you think about our ability to communicate as human beings, things through a piece of choreography or a piece of music, how global that is and how it transcends language and how we can connect as human beings for me is so important. I often get inspiration just from going to the museum, going to LACMA or going to the Broad. I love watching modern dance because that also inspires me. It's almost like it unlatches something in a different part of my brain when I could be working on a script or an outline and being so like literal about what the characters need to do and how the plot needs to go. And I can listen to a song on the freeway and it'll be like, boom, that's, that's the idea. So it really helps. I mean, to that point on Nashville, I was breaking an episode that I was writing and we couldn't figure out the Juliet Barnes storyline. We just, we had Raina James' storyline figured out and the C story. We could not figure out Hayden Panentier's character's story for the episode. Our music supervisor came in, Frankie. She brought a song in that was usually, would usually go to another actress on the show because of her voice. It was a ballad. It was more ballady, more emotional, where Juliet Barnes sang the like the top 40 kind of country music. I heard that song and I was like, that song is Juliet Barnes story for this episode. Hmm. So I really get a lot from different art forms and, you know, in terms of inspiration, healing, I really identify with that aspect of the show that in, in the face of so much devastation that this Shakespeare troupe is kind of the balm that this sort of the broken soul of all these people left need. And I feel like, during the pandemic, that's why streamers, you know, we were all binge watching 
part partially to escape yeah <laughs> this big unknown <laughs> mostly to escape but also you know there were so many great shows that i watched over the pandemic that i you know and things that i went to watch on netflix and amazon that i had missed before and i went back and watched because i had the time you know i recently have realized that I I love what I do so much that I don't rest enough. Hmm. And for me, I've realized that the importance of having a day of rest when I'm busy, like there were weeks on MacGyver when I didn't have a day of rest because I was in Atlanta producing during the pandemic wrapped in PPE because we were shooting before there was a vaccine. And then on the weekends, working on cuts with the editors on Zoom reading people's outlines and talking to the writers and giving them notes that I didn't rest enough. And I just came off another period recently where I wrote this past season, three network pilots all between the span of November and March. Hmm. And I pulled 10 all nighters during that time. <sighs> I gained 10 pounds. And when I turned everything in, I was sick for two weeks and it wasn't COVID because uh... they kept testing. It was exhaustion. Oh, wow. It was exhaustion. And so mm. I have learned to stay creatively fresh. I need rest, not rest of a Saturday where it's like, oh, and we're going to go to the baseball game and then we're going to go to the meeting. No, I need to sleep late. I need to wake up, eat whatever I want to eat and sit on the couch and flip through a magazine, maybe watch an episode of television. I need my soul needs rest. And I'm so thankful that my husband is a hands on dad. So those days when I need that, we're both middle children. So I think we naturally retreat after a very intense creative time. And so we're so, we only have one child and now she's 15. So if mama is like, I'm going to take a three hour nap, she, she's fine. She can read a book or do her homework or be on Zoom with her friends or, or go to the mall. Um, but rest for me, in, in addition to like feeding myself with other art, but I really have had to check myself when I'm going to the museum. I'm like, am I going to the museum to enjoy art or am I going to the museum to collect ideas and to be inspired? I, you know, there's a difference between refreshing yourself with art or going to it with the intention of mining. That's not rest either. I've had to really check myself. It's also hard. I gotta be honest. It's hard to read a novel without thinking like, oh, this would be a great adaptation. So mm -hmm. even reading has become work. Mm. Wow. So, really, so rest really is the best way to recharge creatively for me. You know, it's interesting because that also holds true for someone who's trying to build muscle at the gym. You work out really hard and then it's the resting period that where the muscles are rebuilding and you're growing stronger. If you worked out every day, you'd destroy yourself. I mean, you, you can't, you would not gain muscle at all because of that rest time. So it's interesting how we're just built that way, that we're just mm -hmm. built to need that rest to mm -hmm. just thrive as people. And I just learned that lesson, Alan, because I've been like working out, trying to get these 10 pounds off. And I said to my husband on like day seven of like starting to get back in shape, I was like, why isn't the scale moving? And he said exactly what you, he's like, have you had a rest day? I had done like 10 days in a row. He's like, honey, have you had a rest day? And I said, no, I have to get this weight off. And he said, what you said, your body needs a rest day. Mm. I was mm. like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's like a big theme right now, the rest theme. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you have worked on some of the best known shows in television history. As you look back, what have been some of your favorite memories? Being in the Lost Room when we broke episode two and getting chills when we revealed that Locke was paralyzed and when he the plane crashed on the island, he could walk. I mean, just shivers down our spines. <laughs> that was a pretty amazing moment. Producing my first episode of television, going to set for Prison Break and working with William Fickner with his like intense blue eyes, asking me questions about the script and interfacing with the actors. It was just that was like a career high. Nashville, I mean, that show was so special. That cast, our, our writer staff, Dee Johnson, our showrunner, Callie Curry, the creator. But getting to work with, you know, 
such um, big name talent with Hayden Panentier and also Connie Britton. You know, she's a powerhouse. She was, you know, she was on Friday Night Lights, you know, but that entire cast, so talented. And getting to see huge concert numbers produced, like with, this is before COVID, with hundreds of extras. And, you know, with the playback of the music and the dancers and the musicians and being in Nashville and having those musicians, so such, such great talent. And being at the Bluebird, you know, in Nashville. Those are some career, definitely some career highs. Queen Sugar, getting my showrunner stripes on that show. Always will be grateful to Ava DuVernay and Owen for choosing me to be the showrunner of season two. But also just for me, as someone who came up in network television, who was largely writing shows where the leads didn't look like me, to then run my first showrunner job, running Queen Sugar, where the entire cast was African American, hmm. was like, oh, wow. I didn't ever, I never thought that was really possible when I started on Lost. You know, there was mm-hmm. like maybe two shows, Soul Food, Soul Food and like one other drama. There were a lot of comedies coming up, but mm-hmm. dramas mm-hmm. with African-American families were not on television except for mm-hmm. Soul Food. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that was really huge and inspiring for me. And then I, I have to say when people ask me recently, like what has your favorite experience been? MacGyver. <laughs> MacGyver because... We were the little engine that could. We Mm. were shooting in the fall of 2020 before we knew what was going on with the virus, Mm. before there was a vaccine, writers in a room who had to get to know each other over Zoom and learn their boss and me learn them and and doing it. It was in Mm. and to be able to go to set during the pandemic when we were all like locked in our homes, my husband God bless him, drove me to Atlanta in a converted Sprinter van that we rented and we camped and stayed at two campsites because I was like, I'm not getting out and using the restroom at a gas station. Right, <laughs> it's like, right, COVID right. will fly into my eyeball and I will bring it to set and we will not get to start on time. So he was like, okay. So he drove me there. And I didn't have to step foot outside to use the restroom or anything. Everything was inside and made it there COVID free, got to produce a show, but you could, everybody was so encouraged because we were like, Mm. oh my gosh, in prep, we're getting ready to do this. Are we going to do this? We're doing this. Oh my gosh. Where everybody Mm. else is at home and either, you know, is just working over zoom. We're back on set, you know, the camaraderie. Mm the teamwork, the effort to like get a show made. It was like, I feel like we were high-fiving each other and doing backflips. Mm. That was such a special memory to me. And the executives, the support from the studio and the network from CBS Studios and CBS Network was amazing. Anything that we needed to get the job done, because I think people were so happy. Like, I feel like network was like, are we going to have a fall schedule? Like, we need to have a fall schedule. And right. and we went and we did it. So that is mm. probably you know, recently my most favorite Hmm. memory. That's great. As you look back at your career, what would you do differently if you could do it all over again? I think I wouldn't sweat the small stuff, which is so easy to say in hindsight, but Hmm. you know, I talk about how wonderful Nashville was, but every season we were a bubble show and we were hoping Hmm. and a praying that we got another season. So that meant I had to go out and try to get another job but say to people that were interested, okay, great, but you're in second position because contractually I have to go back to Nashville. So it was just this mm. weird little dance. And during those times, I was always stressed out. Mm. I was always nervous and anxious and snippy with my husband and my daughter. And there wasn't a lot of joy. There was a lot of work. So even when it was supposed to be like my hiatus, we didn't know if it was a hiatus or you were just going to have to go get another job. So I always, I feel like I would, I needed to manage my stress better and I needed to trust that God was going to provide. I didn't need to worry. You know, he he always comes through, but I don't know. I feel like I always have to learn the worry lesson over and over again. Mm. I wish I wasn't sort of like wired that way. I wish I, you know, was like, everything's going to be all right. But you know, (laughs) 
I feel like it goes up and down. So that's what I would do differently. I would, I would be like, you know what, it's going to work out as long as you do the work and you put the work in. I think Mm. worrying is something that I would really try to work on. Well, you've been part of many different writer rooms. So there must be something very affable about you that works well with others because that's so important in what you're doing. How have you developed as a collaborator? That's a great question. So I would say there's two things. One, I moved around a lot as a kid. I Hmm. went to 13 different elementary and junior high schools because my dad worked for the government. Yes. So 13 Uh times I had to reintroduce myself and we're not Mm. talking, you know, within the same state. I mean, I, I went to school in Indiana, I went to school in Illinois, Oklahoma, Texas, New Jersey, a lot of change. And when I look back on that, it really prepared me for this industry. You're constantly moving. So I think there was something sort of in my DNA as a kid, having to move around like that, that prepared me for TV. When I look back at how I was as a child and in high school, I was really much more of an introvert. You can't be an introvert in TV. You have to talk in the room. You're Mm -hmm. an introverted writer. You might want to be a feature writer or a playwright. But in the room, you really have to contribute because people are looking for ideas to get on the board to then become an outline, then become a script. I think college helped me come out of my shell a lot, but... I would say I'm naturally curious about people and empathetic, I think is sort of like one of my, I have a lot of empathy and compassion and I want to know people's stories. So I think that helps. I think I've been really good at being able to relate to other people. You know, even, even in the most extreme situations, when someone tells me a story about another person and, Oh, and this happened to them and this happened to them. And I'm like, Oh, I just try to put myself in the other person's shoes. And I think I also, honestly, I feel like I have hit the lotto working in television. It is my dream job. I get to go and sit in a writer's room for eight hours a day and talk story and character and big set pieces. So I want to have fun and I want to have fun with the people that I'm working with. So I don't know. I just think I try to relate and, you know, treat people the way I like to be treated. You mentioned God earlier. What has your spiritual journey looked like? My grandparents on the African-American side of my family were Baptist. And I went to their church with them when we lived in Illinois. And, you know, my grandfather was a deacon. My grandmother was a deaconess. I have memories of when I was really little going with my grandfather to go visit the sick and shut in from the church. The people who couldn't come to church the deacons would go and visit during the week because they couldn't go. And I remember sitting and watching him just like hanging out and chatting or like bringing cookies or something. So, and then we moved, you know, because then we started our, whatever, seven years of moving around America. And I didn't go to church at all. And my stepmother was an atheist. And my dad, even though he was raised, going to church was kind of, to be honest, he was burnt out on church. So he was really not trying to go to church. So it was like this long gap, you know, but I was very close to my grandmother and my grandfather and they just left a really strong impression on me. And so then it was really after college that I was like, I kind of went, honestly, in college, I started going on a spiritual journey. I was like, well, my mom's side of the family, they were Hindu and Buddhist. So I took a religion course in college, like where we studied all the different religions And I was like, uh, Hindu and Buddhism, not really for me. And then it wasn't really until I was in New York and I was running around crazy and really trying to find my way as like a young playwright and director and really starting to burn out that I started going to a black Baptist church in Harlem with a friend of mine. And I was like, okay, I don't know why it took me so long to find my way back here. But this is where I belong. And then talking to my husband, who was also grew up in a Black Baptist family, where he was starting to really like get serious about his faith again, it just sort of like all like clicked so that when I moved to LA, I started going to his church. And it was such an exciting time because I was like, in my 20s, and everyone at our at our old church, we were just so excited to learn and our pastor really was a good teacher. 
I mean, mm. we all had our notebooks out and we were, we would go after mm. church, go to brunch and talk about the sermon. And he was breaking it down mm. and telling you the Greek and Hebrew roots of the words. And if I felt like I was in college again, and we were all so inspired. And then, you know, once Sterling and I got married and had a kid, we couldn't drive all the way to Inglewood to go to church because we live in the valley. So we, we now we go to a church in, in the valley, but and our daughter goes to the, the youth ministry and she loves it. And that's our church home. And for me, that's sort of I have to have it has to be a vertical relationship. Because I have to be honest, I didn't go to church for during the pandemic. I watched it online, you know pretty faithfully for the first few months. And then I completely fell off. I was like, I just fell out of the habit, but I still was like getting in the word. I was still praying with my prayer partners. I was still, you know, having a relationship with Christ. That's really important to me. That's the foundation of who I am. Um, That's the rock that I cling to. And it's really Mm -hmm. interesting to me because my mom told me the story of her family we're from Northern Korea, originally Pyongyang. And my, my grandmother was a seventh day Adventist and she wanted to go to college in America and become a missionary, but her, my, my great grandfather wouldn't let her. So she was kind of like the first on the Korean side of the family that was a Christian and was like a really strong Christian. And what made sense to you in that black Baptist church in New York that you connected to that you weren't connecting to as you were kind of going through the different comparative religions? Honestly, nobody. And I I, I said to my grandmother once, I was like, even when I was going to church with her as a child, I said, how come y'all never told me it was about having a relationship with Christ? I I thought it was about going to church and sitting in the pew that that was Hmm. what being a Christian was. And at that Mm. church in Harlem, when I went as a 20 something post college, he broke it down. You might not be able to, you might be a sick and shut in. Does that mean if you can't go to church that you're not a Christian? No, you can have a one-on-one relationship with Christ yourself. You Mm. can talk to him Mm. yourself. You don't need the intermediary of a pastor or a priest and a congregation. Mm. It's about a relationship. Mm. So that Mm. was the mind blowing thing that I had no one had really broken it down in a way that either I could understand or was ready to receive. Wow. And how did that change your life at that point? For me, it changed everything because I was so focused on career post-college. Hmm. It was theater at the time. I hadn't made the transition into TV yet. It was career, 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 career. Hmm. And I remember running. I had a fellowship at a theater in New York. I was so proud. It was a, a fellowship at Second Stage Theater, which has launched the career of a lot of female playwrights like Wendy Wasserstein hmm. and Teresa Rebeck. So I was so excited to get that fellowship for directing. And then I was also directing a play on the side and, and helping another, you know, playwright that I knew do a stage reading. And I remember going to a deli, grabbing lunch, going back to my apartment that I shared with two other women, shoving the food down my throat and trying to eat because I had to get out the door in 30 minutes and I vomited because it was like, wow. it was too much. Wow. And it was like, mm. that was right before I went to church. And it was like, it was almost like God was like, girl, you're doing too much. What are you running around here doing all this stuff? You're doing too much. Your career will happen. Stop striving so hard. I had no balance in my life. So after realizing like, oh, it's about a relationship with God, helped reframe things. I stopped striving so much. I stopped trying to make it happen. I feel like in entertainment, we feel like we have to make it happen, make it happen in a way that is defeating sometimes, in a way that exhausts us. It completely depletes our soul. We have no balance in our lives. And that's the thing that was like, oh, okay, I can have a relationship with Christ. That is the center. And I will focus on that and everything else will come in its natural order and time. And honestly, I had so much more peace after that. And how do you continue to stay spiritually healthy while working in entertainment? I 
have friends who are my prayer partners, my girls from my old church who have known me since I was, you know, the writer's assistant on 24, who will call me on my stuff. You know, they just keep my feet on the ground. They're also my prayer partners. If I'm nervous about something, I'm like, girl, I don't know why I'm so worried. Will you pray with me? They keep me grounded. And my husband, my husband, you know, easy breezy, go with the flow, super chill is also like, you are stressing too much. Like, this is what my daughter, my husband will say when I'm anxious or anxiety ridden. Have you, have you had your quiet time today? (laughs) (laughs) they know the difference between mama who has not had any quiet time with the lord and mama who has they like mama who has had her quiet time who has had her soaking music wash over her who has had her prayer time because she is not anxious she is not snippy she is not mean that's great and how has your faith impacted what you write and produce There's a perception of what a Christian is in the media and in television that is not my reality. Mm. I mean, and I love The Simpsons, but Mr. Oakley Doakley is not how I run (laughs) through this world. Okay? (laughs) So for me, it's like just being myself in a room and, you know, usually it comes up like the second or third week. Like, what did you do this weekend? I went to church. You know, so I'm very open about my faith and I feel like in the same way that I want realistic representation of people of color and women, blacks and Asians, I would like to see that too with Christians because it's not a one size fits all. There are a lot mm. of denominations mm. <laughs> and we're all mm. different in the way we worship, what we believe sometimes and how we live out our faith. It's very different, but there is a one size fits all stereotype right now that I am not about perpetuating. Mm. And have you been integral in helping to change that on some shows that you've worked on? I know that there was an episode of Prison Break where we had this one character, Abruzzi, and he had a crisis of faith and and he had a moment where he met with the prison chaplain and the writer who wrote that, Karen Usher, you know, interviewed a prison chaplain and was very specific about it. And then when she was on set, there were some questions in the room. And so I did step in like, hey, hey, we can't change all that. Like, yeah, mm. they got to say in Jesus name when he prays. Mm. Because mm. The, if we were doing the story about someone who's becoming a Buddhist, I would fight to have mm. it specific and precise and authentic too. On Queen Sugar, we had a uh, an episode, I think it was the episode that I wrote for the beginning of season two. It was Juneteenth. And the family was getting ready, you know, getting, having this big celebratory meal. I don't know if they were black Baptists, but they were Christians. And the, the matriarch of the family led the prayer and I wrote the prayer and she prayed in Jesus name because that was specific to who that family was in Louisiana and how they would pray. So I'm all about like, let's be specific. Let's be on point. I want to respect everyone's faith and I want a realistic portrayal of that on television. So we're not dealing with stereotypes and caricatures. And what about relationally healthy? What do you do to stay healthy in your marriage? That's a really good question. I think my husband and I need to work on that a little bit more. I think the great thing about the pandemic is we've had so much time together. We need to prioritize each other. We can both veer towards workaholism, you know, tendencies, because we love what we do. Like we get to do our dream jobs. He's an actor. He's in where the crawdads sing the new Sony release. He was gone for three months shooting that right when I came back from MacIver. We respect what the other person does. And if you have to go for three months to go shoot in Louisiana, go. I'll hold it down with, you know, my daughter. And when I was gone for two and a half months in Atlanta, during the pandemic, he held it down and my mom had moved in with us and, and my daughter was doing Zoom school. So I think we give each other the space to like do what we need to do and be who we are. And I think just in terms of keeping our relationship healthy, we need to get our date night back. I think it's challenging when you also have children or a child. I realize so much of our, so many of our conversations are about our daughter. Right. 
and that there have to be days or nights or activities that we do that is not just us relationally being about parents. Right. Because eventually she won't be there anymore. And then it's just the two of you. For my wife and I, we made a role of not being able to talk about the kids on date night. And it's a challenge because we all, we naturally want to go there. and mm -hmm. But when we do, we remind each other, no kids, no talk about kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's so smart. I'm going to steal that. Was there a moment during your career where you felt particularly discouraged? It sounds like that almost happened after many of your shows, but was there a moment where you thought, I don't know if this is going to move forward? Like, is, is am I going to be able to continue doing what I'm doing? Yes. After prison break, after having my daughter, mm. I thought my career's over. Mm. Like, it's hard because you're in this echo chamber of like not working and you're sleep deprived because you've got a newborn. And you're nursing, which is also depleting you of nutrients. You know, I remember not even having time to take a shower when my husband was out. When she became the center of our world, it was so hard. I remember crying and thinking, I'm never going to work again. And like, what's going to happen to my career? I worked so hard. Another woman in the industry said, you really shouldn't have a baby until you're a co-producer because then you have producer behind your title. And I got pregnant with my child when I was a staff writer. I was like, well, I didn't know that rule, <laughs> that unspoken <laughs> rule. And I thought, oh my gosh, it, I'm just starting and it's all going to end. And I had a lot of like postpartum depression that I was dealing with, not severe, mm. but I think it was definitely part of it because my hormone levels were all over the place. Mm. But I was, I, there was a lot of sadness during that time too, a lot of quiet sobbing in the shower because I felt like the shower when my husband was home was the only place that I could really like let it go because I didn't want him to think that I didn't love my child. I loved her and I was excited that she was here. I just thought like, I don't know why for some reason in my brain, my brain was like mom and writer does not compute. It's like mm. career over was like the message that I mm. kept getting. And I talked mm. to friends who've had babies and, and they're like, yeah, I don't know why I feel like that. And I was like, I don't know why it happens. Maybe because mm. we don't have any time for ourselves, let alone our writing, mm. that it feels so far away. Yeah, that was probably the darkest time I've ever had. Career-wise, career-wise. And, and then, you know, there was a point where I had to be like, you know what? Either I'm going to be depressed this whole time, this first year of my daughter's life, or I'm going to have to, like, learn to enjoy it and just let go and let God and figure out how to get a job and just... And I feel like when I turned that corner, that's when the job in Korea came. Mm. It was almost like spiritual. It was like, you got to learn this lesson first before I give you the reward. You got to get over this mental, emotional hump <laughs> of believing your career's over before I'm going to give you a job. Mm. When I look back on my old prayer requests, one thing before we had Dylan, because I think we were married eight years before we had our daughter. Before we had Dylan, I had written down in a journal somewhere like, oh, Lord, you know, when I have a baby, I want to have a year off with my child. In my little journal, forgot I wrote that. Do you know the job offer for Knight Rider came on her one year birthday? <laughs> it was like the Lord was like, I got you. Because, you know, the job in Korea was great, but it wasn't anything really that was going to move the needle here in Hollywood. It was like the Lord was like, see, I told you, I got you. You got your job offer on the 28th of March, which was the day she was born. You have been home exactly a year. That's great. Yeah. At the end of your life, what kind of legacy would you like to leave behind? That's a great question. So one of my mentors was Jack Gilbert, who like ran the Warner Brothers workshop for a long time. And then who was also very active in act one. He ran the TV track. and the way he gave feedback, he said, you know, we're always going to start by a, doing a circle of love. And the circle of love is you're going to say everything that you love about this person's script before you get to the constructive criticism. And it's something that I've taken with me. And I remember at his funeral when he passed, seeing all of these writers, all these people in entertainment who, whose lives he had touched and inspired, encouraged. That's the kind of legacy I want to leave. I want to leave behind people whose 
lives I've touched by encouraging them when they needed a word of encouragement, who, you know, when they were struggling with the script, I took time out and gave them notes. People who I've known who aren't in the industry, old friends who needed a helping hand or who needed a shoulder to cry on. I would like to be that person. That's the kind of legacy that I would like to leave, to be a friend to a friend in need. I love that. Thank you so much for being my guest, Monica. Thank you for talking about your amazing career and your spiritual journey. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. If you work in entertainment, check out the complimentary courses and other resources available at navigatinghollywood.org. Please follow us and leave us a review so others can discover this podcast. You can find other shows, transcripts, links, and more at navigatinghollywood.org. I look forward to being with you next time. 